Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a Monday morning, and we're starting again our broadcast week with The Middle Way with Chang Wang, uh, who joins us from Minneapolis, is it, Chang? Um, and Russell Yu joins us from Honolulu. Nice to see your smiling faces, you guys. Morning, Jay. Thank you. So we're talking today in a special bonus show about how will President Biden deal with China? Very important question, a very complicated question, and it's rife with policy, foreign policy, and also uh, American politics. So, uh, Russell, why don't you scope out the discussion? What are we going to cover here? What points do you want to raise with Chang? I think really, Jay, um, how will Biden deal with China? I think the first question is that we hear every day is, will Biden be soft in China? Um, coming from the Trump administration, which took a very hard uh, position toward China. And the second really hard question is, which way is up for Biden? Um, you know, there is so much discussion because he's five days into his presidency. But we're going to look at today, really, um, what is really problem here? What is the question that begs to be solved? We're going to look at the problems that we have. Maybe we misunderstand China. We don't know enough about it. And I think that's a starting point. What is the problem here? Uh, and how does Biden approach it? It's not going to be an easy fix, but I think the first, we need to look and examine just what is a problem because that determines um, how Biden has to map out the next four years dealing with China. It is a very urgent matter. Uh, and so um, this is what we're going to talk about. Foreign policy is much more urgent today uh, than it was uh, for previous presidents. Why? Why is it urgent? Why do we care? Well, why do we care? It's because so many things are going around that are happening, and we seem to are un unable to really um, have solutions. Um, uh, we, we have many things that are changing around us. For example, the uh, EU has uh, uh, entered an agreement with China um, so that it it's a great big investment deal for Europe. And, and that's one of the things uh, that... that this is concerned because Biden's main uh, uh, approach has been uh, coming to presidencies. We need to talk to our allies. How to deal with China? We have to be on the same page with our allies. But it's it's has changed. Uh, the, the dynamics are changed, and that that really influences how the U.S. will have to work and deal and manage this relationship. Second of all, the uh, major um, trade agreement, uh, the uh, in with Japan, Korea, uh, and China. Um, which is uh, something that the U.S. is not in, involved in. Uh, so there's a, a shifting world around us, and um, what and how we do with China um, means uh, very importantly, do we understand the issues, do we understand the problems? And I think yeah, Chang... Well. I think Chang was going to talk a little bit about uh, some of that perspectives of what is the problem? Yeah, well, Chang, let me ask you a question that did germinate out of what Russell was saying is, you know, how, how well uh, did Trump do? Did Trump make the right moves or the wrong moves? I have my own opinion about that. I wonder what yours is. Well, there was a book, Everything Trump Touches Dies. And uh, it, it touches China. And he did, in the, he did, let it put that way, the first reaction, my reaction, when Trump got elected. My first reaction was the Communist Party would be very happy about that. And, and there are very many reasons for that. First of all, Hillary was not China's friends. And Trump was not China's enemy. There was a misconception, misconception that uh, Trump would do, make a good deal with China. But Trump didn't, if you read John Bolton's memoir, and Trump didn't do well with China. Trump didn't know how to negotiate, how to deal with a very sophisticated bureaucratic system like China. He, he knew how to, uh, he had a lot of street smart, but he really is not capable to negotiate with these foreign leaders, which have, you know, a lot of background and experience in dealing with American leaders. Let me give you just one quick example, and I want to hear your comments. In 1988, 
in 1988, there was a Chinese scholar, a Chinese professor, visited the United States and spent six months in the United States. And after he, at that, at that time, the common uh, feeling from Chinese toward America is total admiration. They just uh, say that it's time to change China to look more like the United States. Separation of powers, check and balances, independent judiciary, and uh, representative of the democracy, all of that, you know, total embrace of what America had. And America in 1980s acted like a big brother teaching China about everything China needed to know to be a modernized uh, country. Because China just uh, woke up from the nightmare of the Cultural Revolution. But in 1988, this Chinese professor uh, inside the com uh, inside the system, what we call uh, insiders. He was he was part of the bureaucratic system. He published a book as soon as he finished completed his American trip. He wrote a book. The title is, and I really want to have your attention now. The title was America Against America. And in only six months, he found so much. He traveled more than 15 states, and he talked to the professors, students, farmers, workers, a grocery worker, everybody he could find. And he read like crazy about United States history and uh, uh, sociology. And he concluded there are some fundamental structural uh, problem with the American system. And what he see, he summarized in his. Uh, summarize his funding in the title the America Against America. And here's the best part. Who is this professor? This professor is now the top think tank for the Communist Party, and he's the number five leader in the People's Republic of China. He's top five leader in the People's Republic of China. So using this example, what I want to illustrate is Chinese know much more about America than Americans know about China. They are more English speakers in China than the entire US population. If you walk into any bookstore in China, any books, uh, bookstore, independent bookstore, chain bookstore, there are shelves of shelves, English books, and they are bestseller uh, shelf, almost always have the most recent American bestseller translated no later than one or two months into Chinese language. That is not uniquely Chinese. You go to European bookstores, uh, you go to Brazil bookstores, you go to Australian bookstores, uh, Korean bookstores, the American bestseller quickly being translated into uh, other languages. So you may be proud, we should be proud that, of course, that means American soft power, right? But also that means their foreigners know about more about Amer America than American themselves to know about the foreign countries. And one last example, I will stop. Turn on your local new, new, uh, news, local news. You turn on the evening news, CBS, ABC, NBC, or if you may, Fox. How many for uh, how many international news you hear? Unless you turn on a TV, turn on PBS, you'll hear BBC World Service. Otherwise, the average American have no idea what's going on in the world. But uh, you turn on the foreign news TV, uh, particularly when you're in China, that every day they are they'll be bombarded to hear all this what's happening in the United States. They analyze the federal system, the court cases, the Trump and the Biden. They know everything. They know so much about America, and in, it, we don't. Here's a, so that's the fundamental one. One problem I see is the Americans are overly confident. They say that okay, this guy traveled to China, visited China twice. You know he can he can uh, uh, you know uh, be part of the China strategy or China policy. The good luck with that. Then, but uh, the people in in China making the U.S. Uh, Amer the strategy to deal with the United States probably they know much more about the United States. So the the, the situation you described, where um, there was a. Um some good reason for trying to embrace the American system in the past 20 years, that's gone away because I think uh, that book was probably well accepted in China. 
and people realized in China, as, as we in the United States should have realized also, if we didn't realize it before, we certainly realized it on January 6th of this, this year, that America is fighting with itself. And therefore, the system here is not, not so good. And at the same time, the China system seems to be working well. Um, they have dealt with COVID. Uh, they have um, resurrected their economy. They're, they're doing well. And more importantly, they're doing well on, um, on, on, on multilateral agreements in Asia and now in Europe, too. So you got to give them credit for that. But mm -hmm. One thing we haven't talked about is, is, the, uh, is the trade war that Trump started. Mm -hmm. uh, why did he start that? Uh, who supported him then? And who supports the continuation of the tariffs against China? Russell, you know, was there a good reason for it at any point along the way? Has it done any good for anybody? Uh, and yet, why are people supporting it now? Well, Jay, that's a very good question. Um, again, what uh, Chang has talked about, um, it, it, it mystifies me because that policy was largely um, uh, promoted by Peter Navarro who was the uh, the main advisor to the president on that to get the trade star. And somebody who's never been to China, lived in China, worked in China, done China deals, or um, there's a complete fundamental misunderstanding. Uh, I think everybody that's in Ch that are Americans that were in China understood that this was really wrong. Um, the American people are going to be paying for the price, and the companies in America pay the price. And one of the things that really is is mind-boggling is that most of the exports from china are not truly made by chinese companies that are selling in america they're made by american companies in china or assembled things in china um a large part of the percentage of the things that come from china are actually made by american companies okay for american um, uh, consumers but again we fast forward to today, we still have the tariffs. Um, uh, we are in phase one of the agreement. Uh, and because of COVID, um, China has not been able to fully perform yet. Uh, you know, there's, there, it's, there, there are, I think, either 40% per, of the purchases made. Um, so that is something that uh, Biden is toying with. And, uh, and from the preliminary remarks, Biden has said, uh, we're going to still keep the tariffs. Um, and it, it seems to be more of a political issue because I, I'm aware, I'm sure that he's aware that it doesn't work. And we, we're going to have to change that because it's not going to work. It hasn't worked for the last four years. It's not going to work. Uh, for the, and, and, and these are things that are, are complicating uh, Biden into how does he deal and engage with China. But the good thing is China, uh, Biden knows that he has to engage with China and his background of 40 years of political experience knows, he knows that he can walk across the aisles. Well, it's complicated. Uh, you know, as uh, Chang was suggesting, China's view of the U.S. Uh, probably has changed. We know it has changed in the past 20 years and it certainly has changed during Trump. I mean, there's a certain racist element in the way Trump handled China. Uh, he blamed China. He called it uh, the flu, all of the coronavirus, the Chinese flu. But to me, that was racist. Uh, China was doing a, a pretty good job at, at uh, you know, flattening the curve and all that. All of a sudden, this guy is beating up on China on a regular basis every day. I, I call that racism myself. Uh, we have a strain of that in the United States, and it was reflected in China in uh, Trump's administration. So um, that... But that has a momentum all of its own. Trump exacerbated that. So now Biden has uh, the Republicans who don't want to take the tariffs off. He has this racism to deal with. He has the fact that China has gone out and made other deals, multilateral deals, trade deals in Asia and now in Europe as well with the EU. Uh, Biden has his hands full on this. He's got, he's got challenges from all sides of it. Uh, Chang, what can he do? How can he roll back these mistakes that Trump made. I shouldn't say mistakes. It's, it's worse than it was. It was an intentional mistake, many intentional mistakes. But what, what can Biden do to you know, normalize our relationship with China to get back to some sort of friendly arrangement, which we did have before? What, what I can say is only from my personal opinion, and uh, it's not uh, advising by the administration whatsoever you know we ex i 
hope that Biden made it pretty clear that what Trump did was wrong, and the trade war was wrong, the racist remarks was wrong, the the. As I said, the Trump four years was like a gift to China. President Biden, as a vice president, visited China first, uh, not first time, but when he was a vice president, he visited China in 2011. And, and later he made another trip. Uh, 10 years later, in 2021, China has changed dramatically, partly thanks to Donald Trump because Donald Trump basically cor co collapsed U.S. reputation around the world and in China. Now Chinese government can show Chinese people just to look at the United States. The democracy doesn't work and stick with us. That is a very convincing argument now. And for the coronavirus pandemic, in some very strange way, coronavirus exposed some vulnerabilities in the U.S. system. And one is a federalist system. But the China centralized, uh, centralized bureaucratic system worked e extremely efficiently in responding to this pandemic. But th those are, uh, even without Trump, China has changed uh, dramatically. China has now is much more prosperous. The very the the government have like unlimited financial resources. You want they want to build a highway, they can build a highway. They want to build a new city, they can build a new city. They want to build a hospital to to quarantine all these COVID, you know, uh, light symptom patients. They can do that within like seven days. Those are just uh, the coronavirus. It's just one more layer to boost China's credibility and their bureaucratic uh, capability. But to come back to your question, what, what we expect Biden administration supposed to do? And we hope everything Biden administration do, of course, will be in the, should be in the best interest of the United States first. But uh, one thing he won't, we hope he will make it clear, is to a total refutation with a racist remarks and the racist, uh, racist policy. Some of the Trump policies uh, was made and, and designed and implemented was not in the best interest of the United States in mind, but with uh, uh, to, to basically to, it, it's out of this racist you know, uh, motivation. For example, the, 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 uh, the travel ban. Uh, President Biden already reversed a Muslim travel ban, but uh, the China travel ban is still in place. It, was, it makes sense to have a travel ban during pandemic, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a travel ban uh, on China who has like 20, 50 cases per day and, and not have a tr travel ban uh, other U.S. allies, so you see that there's a there's a discrepancy here. Also, the immigrant ban, immigrant ban, is not reversed, but uh, we are hoping that the uh, President Biden will look at into it when he has a little bit more uh, time to look at immigration issues uh, in early February. The immigration ban with banning all the immigrant immigrant workers to coming into the United States. So all those are the issues. But he has put in together put together a very good professional team. Some very good veterans have Chinese experience who have international uh, diplomacy experience. Uh, Kurt Campbell, you know, Jack Sullivan, all these are very competent people. And how about, how about some Chinese members of that team? Well, there's a, a US trade representative uh, 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 Dai Qi, she's a uh, uh, she was second generation uh, Chinese American, but uh, her parents were from Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan. So that's the thing. It you, I, I don't think the United States government is feels so comfortable to have the the you know first generation immigrant work for them uh, yet, and so they are all, uh, comfortable with a second generation immigrants work for the, for them. But when when uh, uh, get to the China policy uh, appears that if your 
uh, have ancestors, you, if your parents or grandparents from Taiwan, you are much more trustworthy than if your parents or grandparents from mainland China. So that's an irony here, right? So the, the administration, the federal government always put into the, put in place of the people from, well, I, I think they already made progress. You know, 20 years ago, they, they have people from Singapore or Japan or Korea to be in charge of China. Now, at least they progress to have people from Taiwan to be in charge of China. Well, your progress is good, um, but you know, what, what's interesting is that Trump went backward into the 12th century uh, for four years. Um, he reversed so many things that were positive and then went, went negative on really everything. Um, we, we could spend weeks identifying all the things that Biden will have to correct. And the tragedy is Biden will, will have to work for his, his four years or more maybe, um, correcting what Trump did. Instead of moving forward, you know, he has to correct and try to get back to where we were. Uh, it's nice to hear there's some progress about that. But you know, time marches on, Russell. And uh, in the process, uh, China has, uh, has not lost any time in um, e e e eclipsing the United States in trade deals. So it has made, uh, what is it called, RECEP, the trade mm -hmm. deal in, in Asia. It has made that deal, multilateral deal. And it has made a deal with the EU, multilateral deal. And this, and correct me, but this sounds to me like it makes it very hard for the U.S. to generate its own multilateral deals. It has, it has lost ground. It has been squeezed out of the multilateral trade business. And so Biden really has a challenge to try to be, you know, get back the leadership the United States had in multilateral trade deals. Am I right about that? Yes, Jay. I think, and I think uh, how we look at it is, to, is what kind of leadership does America play in the role today, given we have what the things that Trump has done and what his Chang has mentioned. Um, I think it's going to be very tough uh, for Biden to try to work out with the allies, as, as he's quoted the paper saying, trying to work out a multilateral approach. Uh, very difficult because, again, um, uh, China has in the last four years and uh, we see this COVID virus has been really leading the global world economy. Uh, 2028 is the magic date. They say China will overtake uh, the U.S. to be the number one economy. I think it's sooner. I think it's going to be 2025. Uh, all of these things are working against Biden. He doesn't have the time. And I think, uh, Jay, just a perspective, I was watching a, a show about um, uh, black Americans who left the U.S. in 1930s to start a new life in Soviet Union, then Soviet Union, now Russia. And so they're interviewing them today, the descendants. And one of them had struck a note that really hit down deep when I heard her say the difference between um, being in Russia uh, and the, uh, the discrimination, the racism, the U.S. And this woman was like in her 80 years old. She's like the third generation following her ancestor that left America to escape the lynchings in the South. And she said, America is built on state racism. Now, in Russia, it's not state racism. It's casual racism. <laughs> casual racism means on the street, somebody doesn't like you because you're black, and they'll tell you that. And she said, that's okay. But when you're in a state racism system where, for example, what we see what Trump has been doing is institutionalize um, this racism, you know, talking about the coronavirus as being Chinese, uh, uh, you know, uh, all of this stuff is state racism. Then how do you deal with that when you have to deal with a larger problem? You know, getting on back track in the world. Uh, and China's going to overtake and be the number one economy, whether we like it or not. And, and again, the second problem that I see is the leaders that have all signed up to uh, vote for certification of uh, President Joe Biden. Uh, these are the ones that are, are uh, the real hawks on China. You know, so again, it's going to be a very difficult thing for Biden politically, domestically. And again, going back to what Chang said, it's important because we don't know China. Just because you went there, you had some meetings, it doesn't make you China expert. And I think that's where we have a problem. You can't figure a problem unless you know what the problem is. And you can't figure out the problem unless you really know the other side. Uh, you have to have something like that. That's true. And, and as we've all seen, uh, gee, it's 20 years ago, uh, but maybe more recent than that, 
American companies go over there. They, they, they don't adequately study it. They don't understand the, you know, the way the business community works. Um, and they get in trouble. Uh, even local companies here in Hawaii went over there and they got turned on their heads uh, and they had to leave. Um, so, you know, I guess what I'm saying is um, you, you have to be sophisticated if you want to deal with China. You have to know China. And it's, it's, a, it's a deep subject. It's sophisticated. It's complex. And uh, if you don't do that, then you, you, you can't win. Not then, not now. Uh, and the problem is, as, uh, as you both have said, that the average American doesn't know anything about China. This is a big problem. Worse than that, the average American, at least in the hinterland, and, and Peng, you probably see this in Minneapolis, there are people in the hinterland that are still on the, on the Trump track here. Uh, they have very peculiar views of China, and it's very hard to get them to come around. We need national policy to develop a good relationship. It has to be friendly. It has to be fair. It has to have a lot of communication. And it has to, it has to be tough where it needs to be tough, like intellectual property and, and the whole thing about investments in China. Um, we could do that, but we have to have the support of Trump's base in order to do that. Otherwise, you have Republicans opposing everything that anyone, including Biden, tries to do to reestablish a, you know, a, a, an appropriate relationship with China. How is he going to deal with that? How is he going to educate the, the country um, on, on, on coming around to a, um, a fair-minded and, and pragmatic policy with China? Oh, the question for me? Yeah. Go ahead, Shang. I, I need a really hard one for you, Shang. It, 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 okay, it, 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 okay, Russell? It's okay. Please. It is a hard one. I, 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 actually, you already answered it. You know, what, what Biden can do in the, in the coming years, what this administration, we put a lot of confidence and hope in it, is we just hope that they can repair the damages that have been done for the past four years. That's the most important thing. And we, even without any additional progress, we already, you know, be thankful. But uh, no, for, first thing first, all the damages need to be repaired. And we are in a much, in the United States, we are in a much weaker position to uh, argue uh, with China on the international stage right now. You know, the Americans need to be aware of that. You care about the, you know, the democracy in China, do you? And when you do not care about the uh, human rights and the Black Lives Matter in the United States, when you even challenge your own democratic process, when you have a government censor, uh, sanctioned the riot against the one branch, one branch sanctioned and incited insurrection against another branch of the government, when the, the temple of democracy, U.S. capital, was occupied by these insurrections, the Proud Boys and the Megas, and how can you argue, how can you say with a straight face, you really deeply care about the human rights and the labor condition and, and in, in, in China? You, you, you lost the credibility of that. So what do I believe that some people deeply care about these, they are true believers. Many of them work in the uh, current administration, but they will have a very, very tough time to first convince our allies in Europe and that uh, all the policy we are going to implement uh, making sense is in the best interest of the United States and uh, European allies. Second, uh, you will have a very hard time to argue with Chinese. You know, under Clinton administration, United States uh, government almost always use that the civil rights and human rights issues as a leverage to uh, in the treaty negotiation. You can't do that anymore because China is much more prosperous right now that uh, uh, technology much more advanced. And also for, for the past four years, uh, there's, there's a, American lost a lot of credibility and the soft power. So 
the two long story short i really hope that uh, uh, the current current government can do some meaningful in some meaningful way to repair the damage and restore the credibility yeah we need it we need it on so many levels and your points are well taken but i don't want to uh, i don't want to step into russell's shoes on this russell it's up to you to summarize this discussion and to point us forward um, and to give us the larger conclusion, if you will, what can be done. Thank you, Jay. I, I think that what we're seeing in this last election, all of these things, all of these domestic things are happening. As Chang would agree, this is sort of like America's cultural revolution. And, and coming from somebody like me, who I am not Caucasian, um, I look with a different filter, and it's sort of like I'm saying, who is an American? Because we're not on the same page, obviously. And because we're not on the same page, you know, when you deal with China, they're looking at America. Who do we deal with? Who can we trust to, to negotiate? We tried with Trump, okay, and it didn't work, and we got bashed over our head. And to the point where, at least, I don't know if it's true, Chang, but where Xi Jinping has a communication with Howard Schultz of Starbucks. Maybe he's an American that knows China more than Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Um, but again, um, I think that what, not only it's figuring China out, but it's figuring America out. Because as Chang said, how can we deal with China when they're looking at us? Uh, we don't have a position of strength. Um, we have this, a uh, lot of the civil rights problem, you know, discrimination that's going on in America. And the um, uh, the political um, machine doesn't work, uh, as we saw from the January 6th uh, riot on, on Washington, D.C. So all of these things, again, go back to this thing. Joe Biden has to not only look to China, but domestically. He has yeah, to you know, I, 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 I get that you guys have made a, a very strong statement that we really have to pay attention. Uh, and I would like to close with, with one thought that I take out of this is, and it's uh, to go back to Chang's word about trust, um, sort of long-term Guanxi. You know, you can spend years building Guanxi and blow it in no time at all, which is what we've done. Um, and now you see the question of trust is, is out there. And what, what is very troubling is, is the, the transfer of power at the end of a four-year or eight-year administration. Because what can happen is, and we have seen this, we are seeing it now, is the whole thing flips. Um, whatever you did before, you change it, you turn it around, you make it. So, so if I'm China and I'm looking for long-term Guanxi, I'm looking for trust, you know, the American system does not really yield that because we turn it over every four years or eight years. Can we be trusted? And I think that's the long-term model, the long-term issue. Um, you know, even if Biden does a wonderful job, how do the Chinese feel about the end of the Biden administration and the possibility that a Republican who stands in the shoes of Trump, who takes the same positions as Trump, will not replace him. This is very troubling for me and I'm sure for, for you and for them, of course. Thank you very much, Russell Liu and uh, Chang Wang for joining us. We'll see you next, next Monday again uh, for more of The Middle Way. Such an interesting show. Aloha, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thanks care. Too.